Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away wrath. If a wise man contendeth with a foolish man, whether he rage or laugh, there is no rest. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. If a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are wicked. The poor and the deceitful man meet together. The Lord lighteneth both their eyes. The king that faithfully judges the poor, his throne shall be established forever. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth, but the righteous shall see their fall. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 22. One of the problems with sin, and there are a multitude of problems with sin, is that it leads us into more sin. It is a slippery slope that uh, kind of snowballs as we go down. The further we go, the harder it is to correct the situation. Now, thankfully, there is a gracious God who can forgive us all our sins. But sin always has consequences. Even when we are forgiven by our Heavenly Father, there may be temporal repercussions and scars that will not soon fade. Jehoshaphat, the king that we're going to be looking at, as we have seen, started out exceedingly well. Probably one of the best in Israel's history. But then he made a marriage treaty with wicked King Ahab of the northern kingdom of Israel. Seeking peace is is not a bad idea. But to be yoked with the wicked is not, regardless of what the intentions may be. Jehoshaphat's treaty will put him into an awkward and, frankly, dangerous position. One sin leading to to another. When a believer is walking in sin, he loses... Now, I want you to get this. This is where the rubber meets the road. Think about about your own life. Think about your, your Christian experience. When the believer is walking in sin, he loses the power of God. You quench the working of the Holy Spirit of God by your sin. You don't lose your salvation. You do not cease to be his child. But you quench the working of the Spirit. You quench the power of God working in your life. Believers who who suddenly go off into heretical teachings or a wicked lifestyle have laid a groundwork that puts them where they are. The sin that allowed those errors to come into place were usually sins of the mind or things that people that were going on that other people didn't know about. Groundwork was laid. It's been said that every tragedy in human character is preceded by a process of wicked thinking. And it's true. Time and again, when some man has embraced a lie, I see this over, when preachers go, they're, they, they've been on the straight and narrow for a long time, also to psh, off they go. Where did he get that? Well, then you find out, six months, a year, two years, five years down the road, oh, there's some big scandal that later on gets exposed. And you find out that the reason he went off into, into erroneous doctrine, the reason he em- embraced heresy, is because he had quenched the discerning power of the Holy Spirit in his life by his sin. Now, you confess it, you get right with God, and the quenching stops. And you're back to square one. But we have a tendency to hang on to sins that are sometimes hard to let go of for various reasons. Jehoshaphat started his problem simply by doing a wrong that good might come. It's never right to do wrong, period. And for Jehoshaphat, as for many of us, that's a, that's a hard lesson to learn. Hopefully we'll learn it. In 1 first, first, uh, first, uh, Kings chapter 22, we have 
Jehoshaphat stepping into it again. He has gone into this relationship with Ahab's dynasty. Jehoshaphat's son marries Ahab's daughter. And how, how many of you read ahead to see what that ended up resulting in? Okay, if a couple of you have. Disaster, isn't it? Disaster. It's never right to do wrong. There's always consequences. And because of this alliance, Jehoshaphat and Ahab, some of you may remember Ahab is the king that was there with the showdown with Elijah, Elijah's nemesis. And uh, Jehoshaphat and Ahab get together. Ahab is uh, trying to get Jehoshaphat on board with a military campaign. The alliance is going to go to war. The idea is to recover territory lost to the Syrians, or the uh, sometimes called Arameans, whose capital was in Damascus. Uh, in your King James Version, they're referred to as the Syrians. And they had, over a period of time, conquered the region that is called Gilead. Uh, not all of Israel was between the Mediterranean and the Jordan. You had the areas east of there, which are in the country of Jordan and Syria today. And this was the tribes of, half, half tribe of Manasseh, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of, tribe of Gad. They took their, their uh, uh, inheritance on the, on the east side of Jordan as opposed to the west side. And because of that, they didn't have a natural frontier and some of the neighbors uh, over the years conquered their territory. <laughs> and the Syrians had conquered Gilead. And uh, Ahab is wanting to recover that territory. There, a lot of the, uh, the passages in 1 Kings, and to some extent 2 Kings, are the, are the going back and forth, fighting back and forth over this piece of territory. And so, in uh, the beginning of our chapter, we have a giant pep rally going on. How many of you remember high school pep rallies? Well, okay, we're going to we got a football game tonight, it's Friday night, and we're going we're gonna to bring everybody into the gym. And, uh, and then we're going to have the cheerleaders do their things, and the pet band's going to play their thing, and we're going to have some hoo-hahs and cheers and, and, you know, all this other stuff that goes on, and, and, people, and the girls are going to run up and down and then throw suckers into the crowd or whatever they're going to do, and, and try to get everybody rallied up. Going to go to the game. Cheer on your team! We have a, a pep rally. But it's not for a football game. It's for a, a war. And those kinds of things, again, are not new either. I, we saw in the news last week that a certain fellow on the other side of the world held a big pep rally in a, in a stadium to, to garner favor for his invasion of another country that shall remain nameless. At the pep rally, we have the, the thrones set up. Look at verse 10. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Israel is Ahab, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having on their robes, in a void place. It was probably a threshing floor, big open, flat area. And uh, at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, outside the, the gates of the capital city. And all the prophesi prophets prophesied before them. How many of them were there? There were 400 prophets there. That's a lot of people. And they're all saying, all in unison, you know, like they have at the stadium, go to war! Go to war! Go to war! You'll succeed! You'll succeed! You'll succeed! Hey! 400 people, all saying the same thing. And uh, who, are these, who are these prophets? Are they prophets of the Lord? No. These are prophets of Baal. Now, remember, we talked about what Baal worship involved. This is the, the religion that was practiced by the Canaanites that God had told Moses, exterminate it. These are people who are involved in ritual prostitution. These are people who sacrifice their firstborn, throwing their children alive into the fire as a sacrifice to their false god. And over the centuries, they sacrificed tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of their children. And Jezebel, who is the wife of Ahab, another, another marriage alliance. Jezebel is not an Israelite. Jezebel is a Phoenician. Who are the Phoenicians? They're Canaanites from up north on the coast of what is now Lebanon. What religion do they practice? Baal worship. 
Baal worship lasted for, for several thousand years, different places in the ancient world. I dare say we do a little bit of that in the United States too, sacrificing our unwanted children. And Jezebel coming into Israel sought to and was very effective in bringing Baal worship into Israel. And by the time we get to this point, there are only, what did we see in a, in a couple of chapters before, Elijah complaining that he's the only one left in the northern kingdom. And God says, I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. I have 7,000 that are faithful. I have 7,000 who are devoted to me. Out of probably a population of 3 million people. It's not very many, but that's some. And so the prophets of Baal are all giving their, their cheers to gain support. If you would uh, flip over a couple of books to 2 Chronicles chapter 18, where the parallel passage is. And one of the reasons this is all going on is to, uh, to convince Jehoshaphat to join him in the war. He could double at least the number of troops available. He would overwhelm the Syrians, hopefully, and regain that lost territory. Look at chapter 18 and verse 2. And after certain years, he went down, this is referring to Jehoshaphat, went down to Ahab to Samaria. Down is downhill. I know we think up north and down south, but uh, a little different perspective from them. He went north to Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance. They had a big feast as well as a big sacrifice. And for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go with him to Ramoth Gilead, to go to Gilead to war. So he's doing all this, he's flattering, he's honoring Jehoshaphat, trying to get him to commit to the war, and he said, my men are as your men, my horses are as your, your horses, I'll go with you. With the false prophets, 400, who do not know the Lord, they, it's a fascinating thing. The Baal, Baal worship as a dominant feature of Israel was a new thing. So any of the Israelites who were probably over 15 or 20, and certainly the, the ones that are much older than that, would be aware of the worship of the true God. That's what they grew up with. That's what they were taught, at least paying lip service to it. Baal worship was a new phenomena as far as being the dominant thing. And so these folks did not know the Lord, but they knew better. And these are prophets of Baal. Now, what's fascinating is back in chapter, I think it is 18, 17, 18, 400 prophets of Baal had been slaughtered by Elijah after the fire fell down from heaven. But there doesn't seem to be any problem of getting 400 more. Have you ever noticed there's no shortage of spokesmen for false religion? There's no shortage of spokesmen to tell lies. And yet we have a dire shortage of, of, of people who are willing to speak the truth. 400 men. And they're all giving their message, go up and prosper. Because they're telling Ahab what he wants to hear. Just like the, the uh, patriarch of Russia is telling the Russian people what Putin has told him to tell. Nothing different. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's an ancient technique. I will use religion as my spokesman to gain favor for myself. The Antichrist will do that with his false prophet. Down to verse 13. Jehoshaphat had said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can inquire of him? Now we see a little spark of common sense. We see a little spark of spirituality coming from Jehoshaphat. Because Jehoshaphat, as he looks out there and sees all these prophets of Baal, knows the difference between the two. 
He knows that these do not have a message from the God who is, who will actually control the circumstances. And when he asks, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of him? I think one of the reasons he's asking is, is okay, here in Israel, in the northern kingdom, as opposed to Judah in the south, in the northern kingdom, are there still any prophets of the Lord? Are there any left? Jezebel had slaughtered a great multitude of them. Are there any left? Because Jehoshaphat wants God's counsel. Now, he's all... I'm going to try to do some good where I am. He's already made an alliance that he shouldn't have made. He's already in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. To some extent, he is paying lip service to God. Now, here's a guy who, earlier on, we see him totally devoted, and we'll see him devoted again. But what's the title of the message? Sin Makes Us Stupid. Um, that wasn't plucked out of the air. Whenever I hear about some great scandal that some Christian leader has fallen, fallen, he jumped in, he walked into sin. And you look at the circumstances, you think, what was he thinking? Well, that's exactly it. He wasn't. He wasn't. The shiny was out there, the bait was on the hook, and he's just... And he walks right into it. He walks into a sin, and then once he's into it, he's, he's mired in it, and he doesn't want to let go of it. He wants to hang on to his sin. And so he compounds it by his, his lies and his hiding things and his refusal to give it up. Jehoshaphat has made a bad agreement, and he is reinforcing, he's doubling down on his sin by going to Samaria in the first place. Is there not a prophet of the Lord? Very often those who are in such positions pay lip service to God. We sometimes do that ourselves. I'll pray about it. Yeah, right. Or if you do, you're just mumbling words because your mind's already made up. I couldn't tell you how many times I have had somebody come to me for advice. They don't want my opinion. They don't want to know what the Bible says. What they want is somebody to tell them that they're right in the thing that they've already made up their minds they're going to do. How do I know that? Because if I tell them anything contrary to what they've already made up their minds to do, and they came to me for advice, they're asking me what, what, what I think the Bible says and what, I, what my personal advice would be. If I don't tell them what they want to hear, they argue. And you guys have been there too. They're not coming for advice. They're, coming, they're not coming for permission. They're coming for reinforcement of what they've already decided. Oh boy, he agreed with me. Whew, now I can go. Is there not a prophet of the Lord? Because he'd already made his commitment to disobedience. Jehoshaphat had. Jehoshaphat, right then and there, seeing these all, all these prophets of Baal, should have said, I'm out of here. Gotten up and walked out. I don't care what commitments he has made. He should have gotten up and left a long time ago. My senior year of high school, in the fall, my brother and I were invited to a party on a Saturday. We knew the guy. And we thought, okay, he's, he's a professed believer. We'll go. We knew we were getting close because there were cars parked on both sides of the street within about two blocks. And when we got there, the house was packed and the music was blaring and the house was full and the beer was flowing. And my brother and I looked at each other and said, I think we need to leave. And we did. I can think of a number of other times. I'm, I'm, I'm someplace and, and I just think to myself, you know, I really shouldn't be here. And if I've got enough character and I shouldn't be there, 
If I'm going to do the right thing, then you, what, if I shouldn't be here, then what should I do? Leave. Leave. Get out and I don't care how awkward it is. I don't care how silly you make yourself look or how offended the other people may be. Pleasing God is always more important. He's in the wrong place doing the wrong thing with the wrong people. And he knows it. Because here's a guy who started out great. He knows the scriptures. He wants the people to be taught the scriptures. And this is not one of those super young kings. He's been on the throne for a number of years. He's got grown kids at this point in time. He was 25 when he came to the throne. A lot of these guys came to the throne when they were like, you know, 8, 9, 10, 15, something like that. He comes to the throne when he's 25. And his father was a pretty good king, and so he had a good example to follow. The scriptures weren't hidden during his growing up years and then rediscovered later on. He'd been taught the truth from childhood. He knows better. And there he sits. With all of these false prophets, all this false religion in front of him, is there not a prophet of the Lord? He says in verse 7, Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord besides that we may inquire of him? And the king of Israel, I love this. The king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. Notice that's all in caps. That's Jehovah God. It's not just talking about God in general or generically. But I hate him. Why? For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. I wonder why. A wicked, vile man who has turned his back on the things of God, embraced Baal worship, murdered and slaughtered the prophets of the Lord. I wonder why a prophet of the Lord who has survived all this would speak evil of him. And Jehoshaphat condescendingly says, let not the king say so. So they go get Jehoshaphat, or Micaiah. Now verse, th verse 13, And the messenger that had gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one mouth. Let thy words, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. Just go along with the crowd. Now, remember, Ahab knows this guy. Ahab has heard this guy a number of times before. He never speaks good but evil to me. Now, he's not mentioned anyplace else in the scripture, but he's here, and, but there's past history. He's a prophet of the Lord, one of the very few remaining. A guy who, during this time, has suffered persecution. He's been maligned. He has been attacked. And he also was not invited. But now he's coming because Jehoshaphat required it. Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord says to me, that will I speak. Now Ahab knows what's coming. He's not going to hear what he wants to hear. So he comes. And they said to him, Micaiah, shall I go up to Ramoth Gilead? To battle, or shall we forbear? And he says, <laughs> I I'm, I'm almost certain this is tongue-in-cheek, because he doesn't say, thus saith the Lord. He says, go up and prosper. The Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Go ahead, go. Now, why do I think this is tongue-in-cheek? Well, he'd already committed to telling him the truth earlier. And also Ahab's quick response. Very next verse. How many times must I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? You're telling me a lie. And he knew it. You're telling me a lie. Pardon me, I get my eyes. And so Micaiah tells him what the, what the Lord had said. 
And he said, I saw Israel, all Israel, scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. What's he saying? You're going to go to battle, Ahab, and you will die. And after you have died, everybody will retreat and go back home, and nothing will have happened other than the loss of a few men and yourself. You will die. Now, is Ahab afraid and says, oh, I, I guess we'll just have to call this off? Is, uh, is Ahab thankful that Micaiah has warned him not to go? Ahab turns to Jehoshaphat and says this, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? I told you he'd say something like this. Ahab wanted yes men. He wanted to be told what he wanted to hear. He's not interested in truth. He wanted to be told what he wanted to hear. His mind's already made up. He's not interested in what God has to say. Now, remember the history of this guy, Ahab. First Kings has a long section of Elijah and Ahab. A lot of it. And Elijah keeps rebuking Ahab, telling him what's going on. And it, this is one of the, one of the very few, there's, there's four different periods of miracles in your Bible. One of them is yet future, during the end times. We had one during the time of Christ and the apostles. We had one during the time of Moses. And then we have the time during Elijah and Elisha. And we have it not raining in Israel for three years. That caused some serious problems. Especially since Baal is the storm god. He's the, he's the guy who sends rain. Oh, Baal, send rain! There's no rain. Why? Because he's not really a god. He's simply a, a, a block of stone that these people made and bowed down to. The god who is, the god who does stuff, said no rain. And it doesn't rain. After three years, Elijah shows up and says, Call Ahab because it's going to rain. We have the showdown on Mount Carmel. We have the, 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 the fire come down, devour the sacrifice. Elijah prays for rain and says, you better get to Jezreel because it's going to rain and you're gonna be, you don't want to get caught in the mud. And it rains. The God who is does stuff. Has Ahab learned his lesson? No. We have a couple of other showdowns, not as dramatic, but a couple of other showdowns that take place. He doesn't learn his lesson. He is not interested in the truth. He's not interested in the evidence. He is not interested in anything but his own way. And Jehoshaphat is acting as his enabler in this particular case. So here you have the believer being where he shouldn't be. And instead of rebuking Ahab and saying, listen to the man, he's telling us what God says. Here's the message, and then follows, yup, 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 following along with Ahab to do whatever Ahab's going to do. We got one man against 400. We have Micaiah against the 400 prophets of Baal. Truth is usually shouted down by lies. It is. Talking to the fellows on Wednesday night, that if you, if you throw out enough lies, if you have enough people telling you a whole bunch of different lies, and you're trying to refute them, but there's only a handful of guys trying to refute a thousand liars, you're just overwhelmed. Yes, you have answers, and yes, you can refute these guys, but, but I'm, I'm getting so mad, I just can't keep up. That's true with creation evolution, by the way. There's answers to all that stuff. And I can give you a lot of the answers. But they throw so much stuff out there that, okay, we're, we're trying to keep up. But, and the same thing's true with the old school liberals that deny, that, that, that say that the Bible was actually pieced together by some editors. That's been refuted. But it took brilliant linguists a long time and a lot of effort 
to refute the liberals. And there's only a handful of the guys that were Bible believers that could do this. And the liberals kept throwing stuff out there. It took ages to, to refute all that stuff. It's been refuted. But it took a long time. We have one against 400. People believe the lies. It, Frank, you know, think about this. It's only the power of God that keeps truth even in existence or having a hearing or having any spokesman. Micaiah's declaration, the death of Ahab, and the end of the offensive. So what do they do? What does Ahab, what do Ahab and Jehoshaphat do? Well, let's go to battle. What did Micaiah just say? Oh, I'm not worried about what Micaiah said. I have my 400 prophets. They say go to battle and prosper. You will, you will come away victorious. Yes, but this fellow here who is from the Lord, this fellow here who is from the, uh, has the same credentials as Elijah, the God who created the world, the God who, do, the God who does stuff, says that you will die in battle and nothing will be gained territorially from the, from the war. Yeah, but let's go to war. They're going because Ahab doesn't believe. Now, he may have his doubts. He has seen things before that would generate a lot of doubts. Messengers from the Lord. The 400, however, are his prophets. One against 400, and of course, majority carries the day. His desires overcoming the ruling. What about Jehoshaphat? Here's our good guy who made a sinful decision, who is compounding it. He's gotten the message from the Lord. What is this, this believer who is in the wrong place with the wrong crowd, doing the wrong thing? What is he going to do once he gets a message from God? He will knowingly walk into more disobedience. He will knowingly walk into defeat. He is... He's got a double disaster known in advance that he would believe, and he walks into it. It's just mind-boggling. You know what? Sin makes us stupid. I have quenched the work of the Spirit in my life. I am, this is one of the horrible things. Never make decisions. Get right with God first, but, and always stay right with God. That's the best thing. But if you're, if you're out of fellowship with God, you're a believer, but you're out of fellowship with God, never make any major decisions. You are lacking the Spirit's leading. You are lacking spiritual discernment. It's a disaster waiting to happen. But he goes. Now look at verse 30. Okay, we're going to try to, to, to get around this. We're going to try to keep Micaiah's prophecy from happening. We're going to try to fool God. We're going to trick God. Look at verse 30. And the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said unto Jehoshaphat, I... I, Ahab, will disguise myself and enter into battle. I'm going to go in just as your average soldier. But you, Jehoshaphat, put on thy robes. So, I'll tell you what, when I put stupid in all caps, underline it, and put it in bold type, italics, anything that's going to mark it off as stupid because Jehoshaphat complies with this. Yes. All right. The Syrians, they, they're after Ahab. They're wanting to get Ahab. The, this huge army shows up. Oh, there's only one guy in a royal chariot. There's only one guy over here in royal robes. Who is it? The Syrians are going to think, there's Ahab. So Jehoshaphat says, yes, I will go into battle with a giant bullseye painted on myself. Stupid. Stupid. Underline it. Stupid. 
Sin makes us stupid. Ahab's trying to thwart the, the prophecy of God. He's trying to hide from God. And Jehoshaphat goes into battle with his royal regalia on. Now, initially, look at verse, um, verse 31. But the king of, of Syria commanded his 30 and two captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, fight neither with small or great, save only with the king of Israel. Focus your attack, you, you charioteers, focus your attack on the king. Now, they initially thought, yeah, this is, this is Ahab. Now, what else would they think? Ahab is trying to protect himself at Jehoshaphat's, with Jehoshaphat's life. And Jehoshaphat goes into this with his eyes open. Look at verse 34. Now remember, Jehoshaphat, Ahab is dressed as a regular soldier. He's in a chariot. But he doesn't have his royal robes on. There's nothing to, in his appearance that would distinguish him from the other men of, of, of a similar rank. <clears throat> and it says, a certain man drew a bow at a venture. In other words, he's just pulling back an arrow and letting it fly. He's not aiming at anything in particular. And smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. What happened? It hit him in a, in a, in a, in a joint where his armor was in different pieces. Right there in the joint of the armor. It hits him. Penetrates. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn aside, turn thine hand, carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And the battle increased that day, and the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at evening. He bled to death in his own chariot. And then when they take the chariot back, you'll read later on, if you were to go ahead, that the dogs came and licked the blood from his chariot. Because that had been prophesied by Elijah sometime before. The dogs will lick your blood by the ramparts of Jezreel. God said it would happen. It happened. And there went out a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying every man to his city and every man to his own country, exactly as Micaiah had said. Can you trick God? No, you can't. Are the majority right? Nope. But God is always right. What about, what about Jehoshaphat? <clears throat> well, we sort of leave him because the Kings, the book of Kings, the focus is on Ahab. If you were to read the parallel passage in 2 Chronicles where the, pa the emphasis is on Jehoshaphat, in 2 Chronicles chapter 19 and verse 1, Jehoshaphat gets out of this without a, without a mark. No injury, no nothing. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. Well, that, everything turned out well. He's greeted when he arrives at home. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, there's several Jehus in the Bible. Just let you know, don't confuse them with each other. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, a prophet, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Was it right for you to do this? And it's a rhetorical question, of course. No, you did wrong. You were wrong in making your treaty in the first place. You were wrong for having your son marry this wicked man's daughter. You were wrong for going up there to meet him. You were wrong for going into battle. Is it right to do this? No. 
Therefore, there is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Now we'll get into that in the upcoming weeks. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there are good things found in thee. And that thou hast taken away the groves, the different things that we talked about in the first message on, on, on this fellow. And thou hast prepared thy heart to seek God. Now, there have been a few other kings that when rebuked by a prophet, we have at least two others in the, New Test in the Old Testament, where the king got really angry and threw the prophet in prison. Or rebuked him and told him, watch it or you're going to lose your life. I don't want to hear any more from you or you're going to die. But Jehoshaphat, in his heart of hearts being a man of God, accepts the rebuke, at least in part, for a while. And it says, and he went again. He went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim. That would be the, from northern to southern limits of Judah. And brought them, the people, back unto the Lord God of their fathers. All right, I'm going to do what's right. I did something stupid. I did something wicked. I compounded it, and then I compounded it. But now I'm home safe, and I'm going to do what's right. I'll accept the prophet's rebuke, and I'll do what's right. Several lessons. Number one, it's never right to do wrong. Now, we know that. We know that. We were taught that from, from childhood. Well, Johnny gets to do it. Yeah, well, Johnny just said jumped out and played in the freeway. Would you do that too? It's never right to do wrong. It is more important to please God than it is to please people. It is more important to please God than to keep a wicked promise. It is more important to please God than to save face. Now, here we see also God's grace and mercy. Jehoshaphat has been delivered in spite of himself. He could have died in battle. Horrible things could have happened to him. Could have been maimed. All kinds of things could have happened to him. And yet he arrives home in peace. In one piece. God has graciously delivered him. Don't presume on this. Very often, God lets us have our own way. To our own detriment. Sometimes, God very graciously intervenes and keeps us from having our own way. Or preserves us and pulls us out of the fire. But don't count on it. There's no promise. That's simply the grace and mercy of God. There's no guarantees. God does not promise to do that with us. If we're insistent on pursuing a course of sin, God isn't necessarily going to stand as a roadblock and keep you from doing it. He may let you have your own way, and he often does. Matter of fact, I dare say most of the time. But I can think of several times in my life where God was gracious and he intervened. And I thank him to this day for it. At the time, I didn't like it. Boy, am I grateful. But don't presume on it. And then Jehoshaphat accepted the rebuke and went back to his first ways. If you're not right with God, get right with God. If you have sinned and then that sin resulted in more sin and then that sin resulted in more sin, God is still gracious. God is still merciful. You can be restored to fellowship with him. What does he want? He wants you to confess your sin and ask for his forgiveness and you can be restored. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Christians, I'm going to let you know this, Christians sin. I do not lose my position as God's child. But when I sin, I lose my position of fellowship. How is that resolved? 1 John 1, 9. I confess my sin. And God forgives, and I'm restored. Whenever you recognize a sin in your life, get it taken care of right then and there. Don't put it off. 
get right with God as soon as you realize you're not. Keep your walk current. He used to say, keep, the, the old guys used to say, keep, keep short sin accounts with God. Get it taken care of as soon as you're aware of it. And Jehoshaphat accepts the rebuke, gets right with God, and goes back to his first ways. May we learn the lesson. Sin makes us stupid. Sin compounds itself. And yet God is still gracious and merciful. Heavenly Father, thank you. I dare say that all of us could put ourselves in Jehoshaphat's shoes. Father, thank you. You are gracious. You are merciful. You are kind to us beyond our, our understanding or imagination. By not letting us have our way sometimes, you have graciously delivered us from a great tragedy. And so, Father, thank you. Father, if there are people here today that have never trusted in the Savior, they don't have forgiveness, they, have, they are not your children in the first place, today may it be the day of salvation. The focus of today's message was children of God who are walking in disobedience. And so, Father, if there's anyone like that today, Father, may they... May they confess their sins. May they get right with you. Be restored to that place of fellowship with a, with a loving and gracious God who will forgive. Father, thank you. May we walk with you. May we serve you. We pray for Christ's sake.